welcome everybody. My name is Reed and today's probably one of the more important topics when it comes to EKG interpretation and that is how do you approach every EKG? Because we know there are tens to hundreds of EKG findings, diagnoses, clinical applications, but when you get that EKG handed to you, you cannot anticipate, you do not know what you are going to see. And so what is the step-by-step -step approach that I use and that I teach others to use for every single EKG? Now, I'm just going to put a plug in here. If you like this form of learning EKG interpretation, go to my website at ecglectures.com. I'll link it below. You can check out a couple of the other lectures that I include in my courses. There's hundreds of videos. There's hundreds of case studies. There's an ebook. It's all there but today let's jump into this so as you can see the six steps that are below we're going to talk through them when it comes to this ekg all right let's jump into it so step number one is the general overview what does that mean that means we just need to look at the rhythm we need to just look at our ekg zoom out don't get hyper focused on exactly all these little waveforms, but just zoom out. We know that the heart is a rhythmic organ. The sinus node is driving this rhythm. And so when we look at our general overview, what I'm looking at is I just look at a rhythm strip and I'm just looking all through this rhythm and getting an idea of the regularity. What are the different patterns that I see? I notice that we have a regular rhythm. That makes me think that, yeah, this heart's probably doing what it is supposed to do. And I look and I scan through and I see it is completely regular. I notice as well that these little P waves are driving the rhythm. And we know that P waves represent some type of atrial forces. And so I know that this rhythm is a narrow complex rhythm, right? These QRSs are narrow. And there are little P waves in front of all of my QRS complexes. So I'm starting to think that things are maybe working right. That's my general overview. I'm looking for pauses. I'm looking for the rate. I'm looking for all sorts of what I would say are themes of the rhythm. So when we look at the rate of this rhythm, I find a QRS that lands on a solid line, maybe this one, and I've got 300, 150, 100, 75. So this is maybe I don't know. We'll call it about 95 beats per minute. And let's jump into our next part. Step number two is evaluate the atrial activity. The theme of today's lecture is we're just going to use the cardiac conduction system. If I come up here to my heart, we see my sinus node is right here. We know that the sinus node, when it drives the rhythm, it's going to fire off and it's going to generate atrial forces. That's atrial depolarization. Remember, that's our P waves. So, the first thing that we're going to do naturally is let's evaluate the first part of ventricular, or excuse me, cardiac depolarization, which is our P waves. So, I, as we said before, we said that there are P waves driving this rhythm. And the next thing I need to do is figure out are these P waves coming from the sinus node? And the way we do that is we know that the P waves will be going down and to the left, heading in this direction because the sinus node lives high within the right atrium. And those P waves, if they're going down and to the left, they should be upright in lead one as well as upright in AVF. Someone called this the P wave axis, just like we do a QRS axis. I look over here, I see that I have a P wave that is just a little bit upright in lead one, but this is also upright in lead AVF. And because of that, we can say that we have a sinus P wave. And as we scan through the rhythm, we see that all of our P waves are the same morphology, meaning they're all coming from the sinus node. So after our general overview, we start at the top, atrial depolarization. Now, notice what are these forces going to do after they go through the atria? They're going to have to go through this little region, which is our AV node. Remember, the AV node sends that signal from the atria down to the ventricles and it does so with a pause remember the av node usually pauses for 120 to 200 milliseconds it delays signal because 
Well, structure serves function. Depolarization of the atria causes atrial squeeze, getting those blood cells into the ventricular chambers so that they can then get um, propelled forward to the rest of the body. So there's a reason for this, and the AV node delays it, and we know that it delays it for 120 to 200 milliseconds, and the delay can be measured as the PR interval. So whenever I evaluate my AV nodal function, I'm specifically looking at PR interval, or AKA the relationship between the P wave and the QRS. What is that relationship? And in this case, we notice that there are P waves before every QRS. These are my arrows. These P waves are conducting to QRS complexes. And when I measure the PR interval, I notice that the PR interval is somewhere between three to five small boxes, which is 120 to 200 milliseconds. Now, we just looked at this PR interval, and that's only telling me how does the AV node work in this first beat that we looked at, but we need to obviously look at the PR intervals throughout the entirety of the rhythm to make sure that the AV node's behavior is consistent. And that's what we do here. And so I'm seeing a normal PR interval throughout the entire rhythm. I'm seeing every P wave going to a QRS. So in this case, that's how we would evaluate our AV nodal function. Now we're gonna go down and what's the next step? In these sequence of events, we have ventricular depolarization. And remember that ventricular depolarization, which I'm putting in the blue here, follows this his Purkinje system and it's going to head down and to the left. So notice my ventricular signal is also heading down and to the left. So my QRS complexes should be upright in lead one and upright in AVF. So that would be my QRS axis. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at lead one. I have upright QRS in lead one. AVF, I have an upright QRS. So my axis of my QRS is good, is a check mark. The next thing I'm gonna evaluate for is the duration. Is the QRS wide or narrow? And I do that because Remember when the AV node passes signal down, it does so via these rapidly conducting his Purkinje system. Let's do it in green. So my AV node sends it down via the bundle of his and these Purkinje fibers that are the bundle branches. And remember, those are specialty fibers that conduct signal very rapidly. And we know that rapid signal, rapid signal means the QRS should be less than 120 milliseconds or less than three small boxes. So I look at the duration of my QRS and I look here and I see that my QRS is less than 120 milliseconds or less than three small boxes. And that tells me that signal is traveling through those Hisperkinji fibers the way they should. Now something else you can do when you evaluate the QRS is you can look at the precordial leads, leads V1, through V6, and you'll notice that my QRS is just barely positive in V1, and you'll see over time, it starts to transition to where in V4 here, it's a mostly positive QRS in V5 and V6. And that's because if I look at the precordial leads, V1 and V2, and a little bit of V3, those are capturing septal and right ventricular signal, which we know is very small and weak, when compared to V4, V5, V6, which are capturing large left ventricular signals. Remember that the LV is quite muscular because it has to pump blood to the remainder of the body, whereas the RV only pumps it just to the lungs right across the road. So that's a pretty good systematic approach to ventricular signal. Now we're done with our atrial depolarization, AV needle conduction, ventricular depolarization, the next thing is ventricular repolarization. Remember, repolarization is essentially getting those cardiac cells back to their state where they can depolarize again. And so the way you look at that is you look at the ST segment. So if I zoom in at step number five, you're going to see, look for ST or T wave changes. So we're going to evaluate repolarization, as well as we're going to also kind of call this our ischemia phase ischemia. So we're going to look at our QT interval. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my QT interval. 
I like the eyeball test, meaning I find a QRS here, a QRS here. I know that if I draw a line midway through these QRSs, my T wave should end by the midline point, which it does. So that's my eyeball test for the QT interval, because remember we have to correct it for the rate. It's a rate dependent interval. It's an interesting concept. And then I look for specific ST and T wave abnormalities. So I look for T wave inversions. I look for ST segment elevation, ST segment depression, and I do that through the anatomical leads. So if I want to look at the lateral leads, maybe I look at lead one, AVL, V5, and V6. If I want to look at the anterior leads, I would look at maybe V3, V4, septal, V1, V2, and we have our inferior leads, leads two, three, and AVF. I would look for specific ST segment or T wave abnormalities that might localize to a anatomical segment or branch of the heart so that I can determine is their focal ischemia is a blood vessel blocked or narrowed. And then the last thing we're going to do is put it all together. So steps one through five, they all need to come together and explain the rhythm, meaning does this work physiologically? So in this case, we said we have atrial P waves that are driving the rhythm with normal P and QRS relationships, meaning a normal PR interval. The atria is driving the ventricle, it's doing so adequately. We look at ventricular depolarization. Does that make sense? Why is it narrow? How is the axis? Does that explain a supraventricular rhythm in this case? And it does. So ultimately, when we put it all together, we're gonna to put these findings together and we're gonna say we have a sinus rhythm at a rate of 95 beats per minute. And that's that. So I hope this helps. If you have any questions, throw them down into the comments. Remember, again, ecglectures.com. If you want to master EKG interpretation and you want to apply this framework to hundreds and hundreds of EKGs to the point where you're just not going to miss a finding, that's the place to go. So take care. See you on the next video.